This is Robert M. Kreis. I uh, want to welcome you to a new series of lectures by me. I know that sounds rather stuffy and boring. The word lecture is no longer in style. I'll try to make it as interesting as I can for you, but I guess if you're listening to this, you've already steeled yourself to the possibility of uh, somnambulism. Anyway, um, I... Uh, uh, obviously don't have any visual aids, though I will read some texts. Uh, what is the topic for this? It is religions of the world. Uh, they used to call it comparative religion. It's still not a bad idea, but it's uh, deemed politically incorrect because it used to imply comparing the other inferior or false religions uh, with the one true religion of Christianity, etc. Uh, that um, is... Uh, yeah, I don't know whether you can condemn that completely or not. Uh, in fact, if you take any sort of a postmodernist uh, notion, you can't exactly blame other people for starting where they're at, namely with a faith stance uh, from which they uh, seek to understand others' religions. It's only good that they do that, even. Uh, for instance, uh, a Christian might feel patronized to learn that uh, Hinduism is able to stomach Christianity by considering a uh, kind of a bastard offshoot of Hinduism, Jesus being a possible uh, avatar of Vishnu. But, you know, how is that any different from Karl Rahner saying that Hindus are anonymous Christians? I'm only glad that anybody can come up with any positive way of understanding the other guy's religion. Uh, so... Uh, I don't think you can require of people who are studying various religions that they first embrace a theology that makes all religions true. Um, any such theology will itself be a dogma to which one requires adherence. In my uh, studies of religion, I have found the only fair way of doing this uh, is to study religions phenomenologically, that is, as they appear to their followers. You will want to try to view it from the inside out if you can. Try to get inside the head of believers in another religion and understand what it means to them. Of course, if you do that, you might find out that it is very attractive and you might even want to switch religions when asked to be open um, I uh, also should tell you that in the terms in which I study these religions, one might uh, aim at me the uh, criticism of being logocentric. That is, uh, there is obviously very, very much to any culture's religion, any individual's religion, of many aspects of it suited to the different aspects of the personality and of the society. There's a lot of ritual and custom and just all manner of uh, affective aspects of it that I don't pretend to cover. I couldn't in most cases anyway, not having had the experience of it. Uh, but uh, uh, what I then do is to study the theology of the religions, the beliefs of the religions, and especially that in a historical framework, how those beliefs developed. Are they true or false? That is uh, really an inappropriate question at this stage of the game, if that is ever appropriate in the, the study of, uh, of phenomenological study of the religions of the world. We want to understand them uh, whether we then disagree or agree is really a, uh, a separate question, a question that belongs within the theology of the religion we espouse or the lack of it. Uh, that will, whatever opinion I have about another's religion is a function of my own. Uh, or of my non-religious or anti-religious stance, or you know, wherever one is at. Uh, but just, just to gain knowledge, just to uh, try to walk a mile in the other person's sneakers, or turban, or whatever, polyester leisure suit as it may be. Uh, so um, the approach I want to take is, uh, is theological and historical, and uh, if you know me from my work on the Bible and the historical Jesus, I can't really avoid that either. I need to, for the sake of my own curiosity, look into uh, what we can know of the origins of these religions. Some uh, 
a little tougher to know uh, than others. And uh, so uh, I want to be fair and uh, hope I can be. I don't want to be ignorant, though I know I am. Uh, there's just an ocean of uh, material out there, and uh, that has always plagued me. I have always felt that as a theologian, I would be a, uh, a sham, a fake, a swindler, if all I knew was my own tradition, that of Christianity and Protestantism in particular. I sit a little looser to that now, though it is certainly my background and informs uh, my thinking even now. I often say to people, if I'm an atheist, I'm a Protestant atheist. Hallelujah! Um, but... Uh, um, I, uh, I want to um, try to become knowledgeable and able to understand and discuss the uh, theologies of other religions as well as I can approaching my knowledge of my own. I, I know the danger there is great of uh, talking about things you don't know enough about, though I think I do know enough about them to speak at the level I will. And the danger is great of being a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. But, you know, whether I've done that or not is up to you to decide. I will issue one other caveat. I hope that uh, this will be the beginning of your study. I mean, you may have begun it long before, but if, if this is new to you, I hope this will be the beginning and not the final word on uh, the various religions. Uh, there are plenty of people with different emphases. I think I've got the facts right, and you would not find disagreement about them uh, in other sources. But uh, there are other selections of material, other emphases, and so on, and uh, other interpretations. And uh, I hope that if this interests you in the religions or any one of them, you will go uh, and seek out other books and histories and so on because there's just way too much to think you're getting it all from me. So with that, uh, tell you what, let's start with uh, the faith of Hinduism. Uh, I want to cover... Uh, well, let's see. I I'm not really under the constraints that bind me in, in classrooms, so I might actually be able to satisfy my own uh, inclinations here, which I haven't done for years in uh, brick-and-mortar schools. I want to talk at least about the big five religions, as they're called. Uh, that would be, and, and in this order, pretty much uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, one might say those uh, that's the great pentagon of, of religions, but there are others that uh, really demand some kind of treatment, even if for no other reason that you can't quite understand what's going on in the big five without understanding these two in some measure. For instance, uh, the ever-fascinating Zoroastrian or Parsi religion. Uh, this one, well, you know, if, if this one had never appeared in the world, I doubt very much we would have uh, Judaism, Christianity, or Islam today. Uh, that's kind of a big uh, claim, but I think it is true. I don't uh, think that uh, uh, these religions would exist. You might have heard of some of the writings and some of the heroes of these faiths, but I wouldn't even bet on that. Uh, and uh, so, well, I think we're going to wedge in Zoroastrianism uh, with uh, regard to Hinduism and Buddhism and what the difference is between them. And kind of is handy to wedge in Jainism there. And uh, while we're at it, uh, why not take a look at the uh, often misunderstood Sikh faith which some say is an improbable attempt to meld and merge Hinduism with Islam. I don't think it is that, and so there's some good ground to cover there. And, uh, well, while we're at it, uh, how about uh, Taoism over in China? Uh, that's, that's pretty interesting stuff. Uh, I, I have to admit uh, that there are some 
ways of belief that, well, that fall outside of the uh, theological approach I want to take. For instance, I am not much interested personally in the zillions of so-called tribal or primal religions. That stuff is fascinating, but uh, my interest in it occurs primarily in the material I cover under the rubric of introduction to religion. And uh, maybe I'll do that some time. But uh, as, a, as I've suggested, I am most interested in the, the uh, evolution, the inner logic, and uh, the, the systematic theology of religions. And uh, that's just not a, appropriate to, to all spiritual paths. I also am not interested in the same way in Confucianism, which seems to me more like a kind of a philosophy than a religion, though admittedly the difference is pretty uh, difficult to be sure about. But uh, just to give you an idea of the subjective parameters here that uh, of my uh, way of organizing this thing, I would like also to... Uh, deal with the Druze religion and the Baha'i faith, both of which split off from uh, Shiite Islam and exist as separate faith communities today. Uh, these are both enormously interesting in many, many ways, uh, and uh, not least the fact that they uh, have some interesting implications for the study of early Christianity if you're also wearing that hat, as I am. But they're their most interesting faiths in their own right, so I just have to say by way of footnote, the Baha'i faith is the only religion I ever seriously considered converting to. Uh, and that's uh, most interesting. Uh, well, um, any modern religions, I think maybe we might eventually get around to... Uh, Mormonism, which is a world religion in its own right, even if you oblige fundamentalists by not considering Mormonism Christianity, um, it, it still exists as a world religion in its own right. And uh, the same uh, with the Unification Church of Reverend Moon, which I'm much fascinated by. So we'll see how far we cast the net here, but I think we've got an awful lot of, uh, of material to cover, and I hope uh, we will uh, last out the whole thing together. So, Hinduism. No sooner have I raised the, uh, the specter of the first religion than I have to say uh, it's uh, problematical to even name this religion or to call it, in quotes, a religion, in quotes. The name is a geographical tag, right? Uh, Hinduism just means the religion of India, or more literally still, the religion of the Indus Valley, the Indus River Valley. So it's uh, saying, in effect, here's what those folks over there practice. Uh, nowadays, you will find members and observants of the Hindu faith or faiths willing to say that they are Hindus, that they practice or believe in Hinduism, but in doing so they're, they're uh, borrowing a westernization. Uh, the, it is uh, the westerners who, yes, if you want to boo and hiss them, now's the time, who in their colonial expansion demarcated this religion of their subjects as Hinduism. And uh, in, in my uh, reading, I get the impression that, uh, well, you know how if you study early Christianity and Judaism, you have come across the problem of the Dead Sea Scrolls and just who wrote them, and the problem is that they never say, uh, because you don't usually talk about us, members of so-and-so. You just say, we and everybody in the in-group knows who you're talking about. Well, yeah, you only start needing these labels once you're in, or in uh, some kind of interaction with others. And so now that that has happened, uh, that even uh, Hindus have come to speak of Hinduism, but I guess this is worth pointing out 
uh, because it it, uh, it doesn't. It, let's say the, this designation, this way of organizing things. This is a horrible mixture of metaphors. It doesn't run deep. Uh, what I mean is that Hinduism covers very thinly, like a tissue, a world uh, of different kinds of faith and belief and practice. There are at least six now orthodox branches or schools of Hindu thought that differ drastically from one another, yet they're all considered okay, kind of like how in Islam there are four major schools of jurisprudence that have different opinions on precisely how to live as a Muslim and uh, what the Sharia says in this and that area. And there's, uh, there's some tolerance, all right? Not everything goes, but you do it this way over there, you do it that way, that's all right. There are even hadith of the prophet where he predicts something like that's going to happen and it'll be all right. Well, in the, in the same way, you've got huge orthodox, canonical differences between types of Hinduism, but here the difference is much, much greater than uh, how you're going to live out certain of the laws. Here, for instance, you have polytheistic Hinduism. You have Hinduism that is ultimately uh, monotheistic and identifies God as uh, Vishnu. Uh, they're called Vaishnavas or Vishnuists, so we might twist them to say. Uh, there are monotheists that believe Shiva is God. Uh, so they might both be talking about God, but that's a little bit of a complication, right? Jews and Christians and Muslims all are talking about Jehovah, the God of the Bible, or Elohim, or Allah, which means the same thing. Uh, it's very obvious from the stories in the Bible and the Quran. They're talking about the same God. All right, Christians believe that this God did things that Jews don't believe. Muslims believe he did things that Jews and Christians don't believe he did. But they're, they're supposed to be talking about the same God. Uh, in uh, in Hinduism, though, who is God? Depending on who you're talking to, it might be Shiva, it might be Vishnu, or it might be uh, somebody else. And yet, these are all considered Orthodox Hinduisms. Uh, and and there, who is the Savior? Well, there's many more than one of those. Uh, there are atheistic types of Hinduism that are completely orthodox. One is a system of logic and physics, Karvaka Hinduism. But then there's Samkhya Hinduism, don't worry, we'll get into some of these later, uh, which uh, believes in souls of a kind. Uh, in fact, the closest thing to God is the individual entity once liberated from the bonds of ignorance. But there is no overarching deity at all in some kind of Hinduism. So what's the deal there? I mean, uh, uh, very much like yoga and a bit like early Theravada Buddhism. Y you don't have a god, and yet it is not secular. It's religious. Yeah, I, I always love to remind people that I'm not the only self-proclaimed religious atheist out there. I admit it's a little less common in Western religion, but uh, there's a lot of it uh, in the world, the religious atheism. So, you know, and again, I, haven't, I have not even scratched the surface of the diversity of Hinduism, but I like to point this out, I say, to remind people in the Western setting that uh, <laughs> the differences that uh, divide off Judaism from Christianity and from Islam are almost insignificant. They certainly are secondary uh, compared with the differences that different schools of Hinduism can tolerate. Yeah, what the heck, you're all right with us. Now, <laughs> on what possible basis do they find any unity? Well, basically, canonical scripture if you try to find your doctrines in the Vedas and then to a lesser extent in the uh, larger Vedic literature commentaries and elaborations on the four Vedas uh, you're in the club uh, there are other religions that are just so similar to this and that type of Hinduism Jainism 
for instance, is very similar to Patanjali's variety yoga <clears throat> and to some Kaya philosophy that, boy, I tell you, it's just like uh, the same thing under aliases almost. But uh, Jainism is not considered Hinduism. Why is that? Well, because they, the, the founders of that tradition repudiated the Vedas. Well, actually, it's a very old religion. I suppose it could be suggested that I never had the Vedas, but at any rate, they're without them now. Now, if you want to compare Hinduism and Buddhism, there's been a lot of mutual cross-pollination over the, the millennia, uh, and uh, with the result that there are types of Hinduism that uh, look very much like Buddhism and vice versa, they're closer to one another than uh, than Judaism and Christianity are. Why are they not considered the same faith? Because of the scriptures. The Buddha, or early Buddhists, whatever, repudiated the Vedas. Uh, they're very anti-authoritarian, and though they eventually um, produce scriptures of their own, that's virtually inevitable, and, and not inconsistent even. Uh, they uh, rejected the uh, Hindu scriptures and did not carry on their arguments, their theological reasonings uh, within those boundaries. And even though the results are very similar, you, uh, you, know, you, you don't have the scriptural basis. It's very difficult to debate. Uh, and um, Or let me put it this way, and this opens a can of worms too. You find yourself debating philosophically rather than exegetically. Uh, the Hindu and the Buddhist do not have common texts to which they may refer, but they do have similar mystical experiences and similar philosophical categories, and so they can debate, in fact. Now, why is that interesting? Well, because it, it at least raises the question that the Council of Nicaea raises for Christians. Is the debate simply a matter of exegesis of the text? Is in Christian terms was the, uh, the the Christology of the dual natures of Christ the result of uh, um, pure exegesis? Can you really find that anywhere in the New Testament? Well, I, I think that a lot of the theologians who debated didn't really think you could, though they did want to be consistent with Scripture. They didn't want to violate it anywhere. But they seem to have known there was a good bit more to it, uh, that there was an awful lot of philosophical reasoning, as when, for instance, some said that, uh, hold on a minute, the Son cannot be co-eternal with the Father. How can they be the same age, quote-unquote? That would make them brothers, not Father and Son. Uh, I, well, you, you see what's uh, what's going on there. Uh, there's no appeal to the Bible there. You're just saying the, the logic of, of the claims is what can be debated. Well, the same thing in Hinduism. And so, to what degree is it scripture? To what degree is it, um, is it reason? As you read Hindu thinkers like the great Shankara, you realize that uh, both are going on and the in a very conscious way. Uh, little was taken for granted. And, uh, for instance, uh, the scriptures being very diverse, the intelligent theologian will realize there's got to be a way of establishing a hierarchy of scriptural teaching, and so some of it is literally meant, some of it is figuratively meant. Certain things are intended to communicate with the masses. Uh, others are... Um, privy for uh, those who are in the know, kind of like an allegorical interpretation. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, if you have different levels of scripture and you got a common scripture, you're going to have different doctrines based on it. And if those doctrines really are philosophically derived, philosophy is perhaps more important than scripture. That may be true in all religions. Okay, now, having said that, how do I square this bewildering diversity with a systematic concern? Well, the only thing to do is to try to vaguely, rudimentarily trace out the evolution of Hinduism and go from one stage to another because each has left its deposit. 
that is, uh, Hinduism is like a kind of a, forgive the comparison, but a zoo. I don't think it's a bad one. Uh, I mean by that, a conglomeration of endlessly fascinating and to outsiders exotic living beings. Uh, if any, as far as I know anyway, if any uh, kind of religion ever surfaced in India, it's still there. It may have changed a bit. It may have accommodated itself to the presence of other ones. But almost anything you can even find archaeological residue of is still going on. Uh, so the, uh, the historical and the systematic concerns are scarcely incompatible here. Uh, and uh, uh, let's see. When, when are we uh, talking about here? And who are we talking about well, I think that Hinduism is uh, probably the winner of the uh, the uh, crown for being uh, the oldest of the religions. I mean, you know, the cavemen may have had one uh, where they worshipped Fred Flintstone, for all I know. But in terms of surviving religions, Hinduism would have to take the cake on that one. Uh, now, again, who are we talking about here? Well, we we can start discussing Dravidian religion uh, which would be the religion of the aboriginal people of the Indus Valley uh, and we know uh, not as much as we'd like but a surprising amount of this without written texts to go by uh, the aboriginal now the, what are we talking about the aboriginal people the Dravidians who are these guys well if you're more familiar with the branch Davidians just put an R in after the D the Dravidians uh, that word is um, a reference to the indigenous dark skinned people of the Indus Valley whose culture was uh, taken over and, and uh, conquered by the light skinned um, Aryan invaders who imposed their um, three caste, adding one, uh, social and economic system onto the conquered peoples. And uh, they already had uh, economic strata, but they had a racial one so as not to intermarry with the uh, aboriginals. And um, so you yeah, have the Dravidians and the Aryans. How far do the Dravidians go back? I don't know. We, we do have archaeological ruins in the light of at least two of their cities, which turn out to be quite advanced. One is the delightfully named Mohenjo-Daro. They didn't call it that uh, because it means city of the dead. I, and nobody calls their city that. I, that's... Uh, you know, that's the hot time in the old town tonight in Mohenjo-Daro. Now, there are no postcards. Come to Mohenjo-Daro. No t-shirts. My folks went to Mohenjo-Daro and all I got was this lousy shroud. No, uh, uh, we don't know what they called it. No texts, remember, but archaeologists call it. The city of the dead, Mohenjo-Daro. You, you really can't help but say that one theatrically. And another one which is known by its later name of Harappa. In case you're taking notes, Mohenjo-Daro is just like it sounds. M-O-H-E-N-J-O and Daro, D-A-R-O. Harappa, H-A-R-A-P-P-A. Well, we can surmise a good bit of what these people did and believed by looking at what's left of the place. There are statues and bas-reliefs, carvings, etc. of, for one thing, mother goddesses, fertility goddesses, who might also have been goddesses of the heavens by analogy. Yet other cultures, the same ones were both female goddesses were fertility and heavenly uh, beings. You, you might not expect that. Uh, I should personally have thought that you'd have two different goddesses for heaven and earth, but um, they don't. It's pretty clear they at least have this, uh, this mother quality, though, for um, fertility and protection and childbirth and so on. Well, these uh, ladies certainly survived into later Hinduism. 
uh, especially today, I mean, don't have to look far, because there are a number of mother goddesses in Hinduism. Uh, I hesitate to say this, but you might think they don't exactly even fit in. Uh, you've got an otherwise kind of abstract monistic system, and then whammo, here's uh, Kali, the mother goddess, as part of it. How did she get in here? Uh, well, um, there's Durga and, uh, and Kali and various others. Uh, they tend to be depicted with black or dark blue skin, uh, which is a sign that they survive from the faith of the dark-skinned Dravidians. Right, that they, they, were, they were very popular goddesses that the uh, white-skinned Aryans had never heard of. They formed no part of their religion. And in fact, you don't find them mentioned in the, well, in the Vedas, the scriptures of the Aryans. Uh, well, where the heck do they come from? Same thing with Krishna, though he, he's a he, barely. Um, these, uh, he's got blue skin. And uh, so this, and Shiva also, uh, these, uh, these gods seem to have simply been so popular that the worship was never suppressed. Like, you can't beat them, join them. And they were just uh, finally incorporated into the, uh, the, the Aryan pantheon a good bit later. Uh, but, again, the survivors uh, of Dravidianism. Kali, uh, you, if you've seen... A movie banned in India, Indiana Jones and the Tem Temple of Doom. And maybe they would like it if they shortened it by a syllable. Indiana, I mean, uh, let's say India Jones and the Temple of Doom. Uh, in, in that, uh, you've seen statues of Mother Kali or Kali Ma. And uh, I just love that movie. Uh, gross caricature of uh, India, though it may be. I tell you, the religious part of it is not the gross caricature. Uh, there was indeed a thuggy sect that murdered people for fundraising purposes. That's not the inaccuracy. My guess is that the inaccuracy has to do more with the food. You're not eating? Uh, well, uh, so uh, Mother Kali is depicted there as a pretty fierce customer. Uh, she's got jet black skin, very beautiful, uh, but the beauty kind of stops there unless she got some pretty weird tastes because uh, her mouth uh, has fangs and drips with blood like Medusa. She has a mane of hair in which snakes nest. She uh, has a necklace of golden human skulls. Uh, as she's depicted as trampling on the inert body of her husband, Shiva, quite a gal. And uh, in one of her avatars, which of course means uh, her descents, her incarnations, different forms in which she appears, uh, she appears as Chinamasta. Now, this, this gal has got to take the cake for uh, being... Uh, the supernatural at its most frightening. Here's a goddess of four arms and two heads, but the heads have both been chopped off, and uh, the arms are holding the heads by the hair, and their mouths are open, and they're drinking blood spurting out of the stumps of the necks. Hallelujah! What a friend we have in Kali! Uh, and, and yes, uh, these are goddesses of great devotion. I tell you, you know, it's mommy knows best, I guess. Uh, one runs to one's mother. Uh, I mean, any kind of mother goddess or father god, you automatically think of Freud, don't you? That religion is uh, a matter of uh, believing that if your earthly father and mother were disappointments, your heavenly father and mother may take up the slack and you're just projecting your parents onto the sky. Well, this would certainly be good evidence for that. All right, uh, so we've got mother goddesses. That's certainly what they seem to be in, in Mahanjadaro and Harappa, and they 
their modern counterparts are certainly alive and well. So uh, one has to assume that, yeah, there's a more or less direct line between the one and the other. So what was ancient in Hinduism is still around. Another depiction of the divine is gods in the form of a bull. Now that's darn near universal too. Uh, remember how did Aaron depict Yahweh? Behold, O Israel, your gods who brought you out of Egypt. Well, Aaron uh, is talking about Jehovah, but he's depicted as a young bull, just as we see in ancient Egypt and Canaan all over the place. I mean, archaeologists have recovered just huge amounts of these calves and bulls. Jeroboam had uh, two temples in Dan and Bethel, each with a calf or bull that was supposed to be Yahweh or Jehovah. And, uh, well, it's not surprising that you've got the same thing over in uh, ancient, in this valley, Dravidianism. Uh, and uh, why would anybody depict God that way? Well, just look at one of the darn things sometimes. They are amazing, huge mountains of living muscle. Uh, I remember seeing one on the ridiculous David Letterman show. Uh, the show was worth watching for once because it was some exotic animal show on tour in the city, and they had some of the beasts before the camera. I... I grew up in Mississippi and Louisiana. I've seen plenty of uh, bulls. I was uh, a witness to an Angus bull kicking in the door of the car that I was sitting next to once. Never forget that. I remember seeing a buffalo tied up in a local yard down there. Uh, so I'm no stranger to the bovine, but holy mackerel, holy minotaur, Batman. Uh, this thing, even at the distance of a TV studio in New York, was behemoth size. This living mountain. Well, you look, and this was from Italy. It wasn't even a Brahma bull. You take a look at one of those, and you think, now, nah, if I were going to depict God in in a living earthly form, what would I do? This would have to be pretty darn close to the top of the list, and so it has been. You didn't need to disseminate the idea from whoever first thought of it. It's going to occur to everybody, and it has. Uh, so they had bull deities, and we got them later. And they continue as well. Sometimes a uh, god wants to pick them as a bull comes to be depicted in human form or not to be depicted at all much later, but even then, the... Uh, the uh, animal may continue to be part of the retinue of the god. Uh, one may still have like sacred totems of a certain animal. Think of the sacred cows in India. Nobody dares lay a hand on them. And, uh, so, divine figures. There was a horned god with three or four faces. One suspects there was a fourth one on the back of the head, but it's only a bas relief, not a statue, so we can't check. But a multi faced god, kind of like the creatures in Ezekiel's vision. And uh, this god with, with antlers is seated in a yoga, a lotus position. And he is surrounded by forest animals. Now, boy, this is interesting because it is not unique. It is paralleled very closely by a Celtic depiction of what looks for all the world like the same deity. And by Celtic, yeah, I'm talking about way over in Ireland. What's this thing doing over there in, in, in Ireland, in the old sod? And also in India, I, I am finding it difficult to understand that. Uh, was there a long, uh, wide... I mean, this is so odd, I got to admit, I have to suspect dissemination. Somebody came up with it and it traveled far and wide. Uh, because you got a god in... a um, pose of mystical meditation and yet the god is a god of nature and animals. He's even got animal horns. What is the deal? 
Uh, well, uh, who knows? It, uh, I imagine it is a combina combination of different deities. We certainly know that that happened in India as it did everywhere else. Like, uh, for instance, uh, Krishna, the blue-skinned god, is a combination of Krishna and Vasudeva, which is why they call him Vasudeva Krishna. And... Uh, Vishnu somehow picked up a similar local god, Narayana, because he's officially called Narayana Vishnu. And uh, so uh, I'm, I'm kind of guessing that uh, that happened here, though it's not the names because there aren't any. We're, there's no text, no caption of these pictures. But you have a horned being in, uh, in a uh, lotus position. Uh, so uh, could there have been trade between these far-flung corners of... The Eurasian landmass, well, yeah, there's no particular reason there couldn't have been. Take a bit longer uh, than it does today, but there are a lot of mythic and linguistic similarities. I recommend uh, Jan uh, Puvel's book, Comparative Mythology, for a lot of eye opening material like that. We don't just recognize it in a Western counterpart. We recognize this seated, horned god of mysticism and of nature in his modern form as Shiva. Uh, again, think of the Temple of Doom. Shiva has sent you. Uh, Shiva appears to be both a god of yoga and meditation and with blue skin. Sometimes depicted only with a blue throat, but sometimes all blue, Mr. Blue. And uh, that would imply, again, the rootedness in uh, the old Dravidian culture. Though he may have been combined with a Vedic deity, Rudra. We'll get to that later. Uh, but at least there was such a god, and this implies meditation and yoga at a very early stage. Now, what would the... As I say, right, maybe I'm just uh, drawing distinctions. A lot of centrism, again, you know, life is sloppier than categories and fails to uh, occupy them neatly. Uh, so uh, maybe I'm just myopic. It might be that it is natural to think of a god of nature who is at the same time a god of of uh, mystical meditation and why would that be? Well, because the meditator comes to know himself or herself as one with all things. You remember the one about the Buddhist monk that goes to the hot dog vendor and said, make me one with everything. <laughs> yeah, well, um, well, I think there's one of the Buddhist hells that you go to for just telling that joke. Anyway, um, yeah, maybe that's the point. You have become one with all, and then maybe that is the point of the horns as well. You know, don't think I'm being some sort of a bigot when I do these accents. I love these accents. I love Indian and Pakistani accents. Uh, so don't think I'm poking fun at them. They're, they're great. Of course, I may be doing badly, but you'll have to tell me that. But, uh, okay. Uh, so, all right, uh, so you got a pretty advanced, I mean, you got yoga going on. You got a pretty advanced uh, type of religion there. If you've got yoga embracing nature, you got an extra sophisticated view of uh, religion and philosophy, I should say. Uh, keep this in mind because I want to mention this again in a second. I've already said how the belief is that the Aryans with their gods and religion already prefab invaded the Indus Valley, took over the Dravidian culture and imposed their own religion. Though, as often happens, they preserved a lot of that religion and adopted it, mixing it with their own. Well, these days there is a movement afoot among Indians to say, wait a second, maybe the, uh, those Aryans didn't contribute as much new as is being said. It may be that the Dravidians, the original, uh, the native Indians, one might say, were uh, already quite advanced and had a lot of these things and the credit is just being ripped off more Eurocentric colonialism yeah it could be I suppose but uh, on the other hand I am 
quick to suspect that gripes like that represent just uh, political correctness. Uh, the uh, same sort of a thing like Afrocentrism which is a sham like uh, the, the idea that the ancient Egyptians were black Africans well, no reason they shouldn't have been but seems like they weren't uh, was Jesus black oh sure would be fascinating if he had been if he existed at all but there's no reason to think so and uh, again not objectionable, but probably not true. Was Jesus a woman? Some few nuts think so, but if there was a Jesus, no way we'd heard about that through some kind of sources. Uh, so, uh, just if somebody wants it to be true, because it would pin a badge of pride on their chest to, to, to say so, doesn't make it true. Once I was at the Jesus seminar, and um, the, uh, they were doing, I remember Karen King was doing the usual liberal Protestant song and dance about how even if not factually true, the stories of Jesus are inspiring and transformative and such. And, uh, and the implication was maybe we shouldn't touch the holy ark. And I said, well, would you support the teaching of Afrocentrism because that gives certain people self-esteem even though it's <laughs> not true? I don't remember what sort of evasive answer she gave. But, um, so I'm, you know, I've got uh, limited patience, that kind of thing. I suppose it could be true, and the reason I'm mentioning it at this juncture is to say, if it's true, here's the graph point. Uh, it's conceivable that it's true because there were things like yoga meditation already in the, the Dravidian culture, so who knows? But it's pretty tough to say that uh, that the whole of Hinduism comes from it. I'm not sure if anybody's claiming that. But, you know, let's keep our finger in that page. Again, I said a moment ago that the Jainists and the Buddhists may know possibly not have rejected the Aryan Vedas, but conceivably they stem from an ancient time before anybody had ever heard of the Vedas. And, uh, you know, that would fit this revisionist history idea. Uh, because the, I don't think they're trying to say that all the gods of the Aryans in the Rig Veda were native to India. I don't think they even care. I think they're trying to claim yoga and such for India. And they might be right. That might have been there already. Certain that the the uh, the Aryans didn't practice that stuff. They got on that bandwagon later. But the issue is, who first came up with it? Was it uh, already a Dravidian practice, a Dravidian worldview that the upper caste Aryans adopted, or was it the result? of the thinking of people in one of the traditional Aryan castes, namely the Kshatriya, the warrior and uh, royal caste. We'll get on into that in a minute, but just to get some things percolating here so we can come back and refer to them and make some more sense of them. Okay, uh, one thing they did uh, in big time, apparently, uh, in uh, the Dravidian faith was ritual ablution or washings or baptisms whatever you want to call it now why should we think this well <laughs> you did have the Indus River nearby so I guess you could have washed in that but the fact that they also seem to have had baptismal pools or tanks I guess they could have been just public baths but you wouldn't necessarily have needed that it implies that you, you've set this off as sacred space uh, for religious purposes. So we kind of think they must have been big on the uh, ritual use of water. Yeah, you, what do you mean you kind of think, we guess? Hey, look, I don't want to dogmatize on certain things. There aren't any texts. There aren't any captions. They, they, they didn't explain it all for our benefit so a lot of the time we're just doing our best guessing but I have tried to set out samples of the evidence we have to indicate why these educated guesses are made about Dravidian aboriginal religion okay the next
Dravidian state. Yeah, as I say, that's tough to date. It's hard to know how the heck long ago the Dravidians or the Dazas, D-A-S-A-S as they're also called, how far they go back. But we can get a decent idea of the uh, age of the religion of the Aryans, the Vedic religion, the religion based on the Vedas. Now, who were the Aryans? If you got an, any interest in history, you're probably thinking of Hitler and the Aryan race and all that stuff. When the Fuhrer says he is the master race, then we hide, hide right in the Fuhrer's face. Uh, well, yeah, he did say that they were the master race, and he said they were the Aryan race. Who is that? Well, there, there was an Aryan race. Uh, Aryan just means the noble one the nobility that's us right? and it's the same uh, word that gives rise to the name of Iran Iran Aryan same thing just you know represented a bit differently in our letters uh, than the noble ones they came from the north and swept through southern Europe and on into India they were horsemen and archers, great warriors, no central government, just a bunch of war chiefs, clans, etc., all sharing the same basic religion. Now, it was very much like you got in uh, the ancient Greek city-states, and that's no accident because you know, they were the same people, right? You got the Aryans imposing a version of their religion uh, in, in Italy, in Greece, in, uh, in Iran, and on into India. Uh, it's, I mean, you can really see it when you compare Zoroastrianism and Hinduism, how they're mutations off of the same stock, but it's not that tough to see it in these other cultures, too. And uh, you find the same pattern of aboriginal mother goddesses being suppressed by the introduction of heavenly male deities. Indra the Thunderer, Zeus the Thunderer, Dius Pitar, Jupiter the Thunderer, and uh, Yahweh, even though he's probably not borrowed, he's the same sort of a deity. I borrowed from them anyway. Uh, so these, uh, these warriors swept uh, immediately, we think, from the east to European steppes or grasslands down into uh, Greece, Persia, India. And they planted their caste system, their Indo-European uh, language, closest, uh, well, I'd say the most ancient surviving version of that being Sanskrit. And uh, they, uh, their distinctive ethnic type, it is thought that probably the people in the Caucasus Mountains are closest to the original Aryans. Um, well, uh, could they have come from even more north than that? Well, uh, Hitler thought that they were Nordics and had come from the Arctic Circle. Now, if Hitler said it, you sort of don't want to believe it, even if you just ask the Fuhrer what time it was. Right, uh, uh, wait a minute, I don't know if I believe this Nazi bastard. Right? Uh, it's a good instinct. Uh, but he might have been right like the stopped clock occasionally on something. There is some reason to think, this famous theory, that the, uh, the writers of the Vedas lived in the Arctic Circle because of their references to how long the sun is visible in the sky. Uh, it's I don't know the details of it beyond that, but I think you probably that's enough to get the uh, the idea across that they wouldn't have spoken of the motions and presence of the sun in quite the same way if they uh, saw it just in the uh, ordinary alterations familiar to us. I don't know what that proves, uh, but uh, and, and I don't know if it matters. But there sure is a lot of continuity between Nordic and Celtic mythology and Hindu and Greco-Roman mythology. I mean, there is some sort of connection any way you want to cut it. I, I'm being apologetic about this because, again, you know, both modern-day Indians, some of them don't like it, and we don't really want to be caught saying that Hitler was right about anything, but he might have been in some measure here. Um, 
who the heck knows. Uh, but uh, the Aryans were at least light-skinned invaders. Now, why? That's even that, right? We don't like to talk about. We're so sensitive. Why bother? Well, because you need to know that to explain the uh, caste system. It was an apartheid system, like in South Africa. A terrible thing, a crime against humanity. But you got to understand it if for no other reason to try to make sure it doesn't happen again. And, and uh, so, uh, uh, let's take a look at the, uh, the casts. By now, we think of caste as roughly analogous to class or classification. But uh, literally, the word is varna, V-A-R-N-A, which means color. It's the color system. Uh, and uh, this does have something to do with skin color. But each caste, even within the original Aryan ethnicity, had its own uh, color that at least women would wear. I have seen and heard conflicting evidence as to whether men had uh, caste marks on them or not, but women certainly do. Uh, and, uh, and the reason for that is it's like wearing a wedding ring. You want to signal... Uh, that you're not available to certain potential suitors. The wedding, wedding ring will scare everybody off, uh, but the, uh, the dot between your uh, eyes and above, that would uh, tell people, hey, are you in the same cast she is? Oh, you're not? Well, you'd better find yourself another gal. I want a girl just like the girl that married dear old dad, at least in the same cast. You couldn't uh, marry outside of your caste. You couldn't uh, get a job outside of your caste. In fact, the castes were defined more than anything else by uh, profession and economy. And uh, you couldn't take a civil defense test and jump castes. You, you couldn't try to do that. You couldn't ignore it. Uh, it would come out pretty quick what caste you were. You'd be in a heap of trouble. Uh, so, um, well, you might think, wouldn't they have an inbreeding problem if you couldn't marry outside the caste? Well, no, because think how big the population is, right? You've got plenty of choices, even within the caste. They're illegal now. They have ever been ever since Gandhi. And, uh, but uh, that doesn't stop people from continuing to live that way. I mean, polygamy is illegal in Mormon, but the Mormon, in the Mormon kingdom of Utah, but does that crimp anybody's style? I don't think so. And uh, still widely practiced, same thing with the cast today. But it does mean the color system. Uh, same word as varnish, by the way, a tinting of the wood. Uh, and uh, the varna is the cast or color system. And uh, how is it divvied up? Uh, well, there, there were uh, a couple of very high castes. And uh, the, the highest one was perhaps not what you would expect. It was not the uh, secular rulers. It was the priests, the Brahmins, as they usually spell in our letters, B-R-H-M-I-N-S, the Brahmins. Uh, there was a... Oh, where did I hear... Joe, well, I don't want to wait on that one, I guess. Now, the, the Brahmin priests, uh, B R in English, B R H M I N S, uh, they were the hereditary, all these castes were hereditary, but they were number one because they dealt with the gods. You had to deal with the gods, you couldn't go around them, so you had to deal with them, with the, the Brahmins. And, uh, uh, this was equally true if you were a king or a chief or a prince. It's like Napoleon, had, well, Charlemagne having to be crowned emperor by the Pope. Same kind of thing. Um, and uh, so the, you want your prayers answered, don't you? And if you're an Aryan warrior chief about to go to battle with another one of your colleagues or your rivals, uh, if you're a Star Trek fan, think of the, uh, the uh, guys on Voyager, the guys that looked like the uh, um, 
Klingons with bad haircuts. Uh, I forget their names. The uh, Kazons, I think, that go rolling along through the universe of the Delta Quadrant. Uh, they were they had no central government. They were just. Uh, sects as they call them but really it seemed like more clans uh, and they had the same basic beliefs and all that there were just a bunch of different instances of it uh, well you'd you'd be uh, praying to the same gods as your enemies probably for victory over them tomorrow uh, so how are you going to get your prayers answered well presumably the gods would go with the warriors who gave them the biggest bribes and the biggest sacrifices so you know, who really gets those sacrifices? Well, they do burn up some of it. But, of course, the priests are fed by the sacrifices. So what a racket! It just doesn't mean people were not sincere in their beliefs. This does not mean that it even occurred to any Brahmin priest uh, that, uh, boy, I'm, I'm making a killing off of these superstitious rubes, right? Well, we have, well, this is no evidence of that. We have no idea. No human nature at all. Uh, it wouldn't be a surprise if they were making a buck, but hey, look, we don't know that. Uh, presumably, everybody was pretty sincere. Uh, and, but, you know, what does this say about the Brahmin priests? They certainly were the most important. And I gotta bring, I gotta keep the gods fattened up. I gotta keep them strong uh, through sacrifice, or they're not gonna be able to answer my prayers. What? Wait a minute now. Who's got the power here? The gods are mere mortals like us, and more importantly, more to the point, mere mortals like the priests. <laughs> yes, isn't that interesting? Who's got the power? Well, the people that can plug the gods in, I'd say. And uh, so, you know, who knows about the motive, but the effect would certainly be to say that maybe the priests are more powerful than the gods. Maybe the gods kind of reduce to the priests and their rituals. In fact, we're going to find a system of Hinduism, another atheistic one, uh, called Purva Mimamsa Hinduism, uh, where the theologian of the movement, Jaimini, uh, let's not even think about adding the word cricket to that, uh, he uh, said that, yeah, there, there were no gods, literally. Uh, why should there be? It's the ritual itself that does the trick and moves heaven and earth. Well, that may be uh, pretty darn logical. If you got to have the, you got to have the uh, rituals to empower the gods to answer your prayers. What do you even really need the gods for? Interesting insight, AMC. Okay, so uh, you're way up there at the top, then you got the Brahmin priests. You can't decide to become one. You're born one. Don't like the idea of that stuff? You got to be one. What if you just stayed home and studied? Well, I guess you could do that, probably. Well, I got a good pal who is a secular atheist and a militant one. Uh, and uh, he uh, eats roast beef, but he's a Brahmin. And uh, I remember once his uh, his then fiance said, uh, "Hey, why don't you help me uh, wash these dishes?" And my pal Sunan Trembuk said, "Woman, are you mad?" Now, the Brahmin would stoop to that. <laughs> the guy's eating at Arby's. Right, he's having roast beef sandwiches. He doesn't believe in the gods or reincarnation, but he does believe the Brahmin male should be above manual labor. So it uh, goes pretty deep, I guess. Okay, so they are number one. Number two is the Kshatriyas. No, I didn't just sneeze. Uh, it's the way I've got this spelled, and I warn you there are different spellings of this one, not so much in Brahmins, but you're going to see slightly different spellings of this one. I've got K-S-H-A-T-R-I-Y-A-S. K-S-H-A-T-R-Y-A-S. Kshatriyas. These are the kings and warriors. Kings such as they are, probably something more like 
warrior chieftains. And, um, they, uh, and they're, they're knights, they're warriors, they're soldiers. So they're all in that rank. So you've really got the equestrians and the, the monarchs, such as they are, grouped together here. Typically, they uh, looked up to the Brahmins and had to. They were in awe of them. They didn't want to get on the wrong side because they wanted to win battles, not lose them. And um, there is uh, some possibility, however, that the Kshatriyas eventually became a little tired of kissing the, uh, the hieratic uh, butts of the Brahmin priests and decided to hell with that. Let's find a whole different way of being religious. And uh, this does seem to have happened uh, all over India, uh, here and there, with the foundation of the Jainist and Buddhist religions, as well as the uh, creation of the mysticism uh, that, uh, well, that, that uh, the Dravidians might have uh, introduced, but uh, also the Upanishad masters. We are told that a number of these people, the uh, Gautama Buddha, Mahavira, the founder of Jainism, uh, and, and uh, Yajnavalkya and other Upanishadic sages, we are told that uh, that they began as Kshatriyas who had become disillusioned and bored with the Brahmin faith and sought something more profound and interior. Well, uh, you remember your Protestant Reformation, don't you, how Martin Luther found it quite helpful in uh, peeling away the North German states from the Vatican to say that uh, the Catholic Church is corrupt and if the Pope won't do it, well, there's the priesthood of all believers, especially since the uh, heads of state, uh, if they're Christians, uh, to uh, reform the church of its corruption. Again, even if their own uh, power is not um, enough to do it. You. So what do we do? I mean, you know, you, the Pope should be doing this, but that's all right. The Pope's not the only priest before God. There's the only real mediator is Jesus Christ, and uh, and therefore every Christian is a mediator in some sense. And so if we see the church needing reform, and we have the power, we can do it. Uh, and so he recruited a lot of the North German princes to do just that, and to say, uh, one king, one crown, no Pope in our town. Uh, and uh, don't think that there weren't any economic and political reasons behind this. You know darn well that a bunch of the uh, German princes said, I don't have to be under the heel of the Pope anymore. Sounds good to me. Uh, so uh, well, Luther and bandwagon advances. You, you just got to suspect that something like that's going on here with a large-scale Kshatriya repudiation of Brahmanism. But we'll take a look. There, there certainly was a religious doctrinal dimension to it. It wasn't mere politics. It is always difficult to separate political from religious aspects. In our own mind, they are not uh, completely separate, so you know, why should they be on paper? So the kings and the warriors. Uh, need I add that if it was Kshatriyas who, who, who came up with a new religion that would draw people away, the Brahmins wouldn't much care for that, and so you would have persecution. So that's in the near future as we draw up categories here. The third caste was the Vishayas. Again, my... Uh, I picked up from somewhere this is one of several possible transliterations V-S-H-A-I-Y-A-S so if you run into anything that looks remotely like that in the book on Hinduism that's, that's the folks we're talking about they are the merchants and craftsmen kind of a middle class I guess so the shopkeepers the artisans and so forth tradesmen and such Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas said, Tradesmen shall never enter the places of my Father. 
Well, that's uh, that's kind of true here too. You might think, "Well, I would love to be a Brahmin." Tough luck, pal. You know, you better keep that grocer uh, apron on. Uh, you better stay in that UPS truck. Plato had a similar sort of a list of social categories too. It's not surprising. You have the philosopher kings, the auxiliaries, which is the uh, the uh, army and the the common people would be like the merchants and so on. Now, these are the same three categories that existed in Zoroastria and Persia, and they just survived straight from the Aryan occupation, but apparently color, at least skin color, wasn't an issue there as it became in India. And because of that, there is a fourth caste in India that doesn't exist in Zoroastria. Uh, Persia, and that is the Shudras, S H U D R A S. These are menial laborers and unskilled workers, uh, and uh, they uh, they don't have a very high uh, position on the totem pole. To tell you the truth, I have been unable to nail down whether the native Dravidians were all shoveled into the cold bin of the Shudras or if this was a fourth break off a subsector case or cast of the uh, of the Vishayas because there is a fifth category which isn't even called a, um, a cast the group of the Untouchables in the film Gandhi when uh, they're in South Africa and they have an egalitarian commune uh, Gandhi says to his wife that it's her turn to rake out the human litter box of a latrine and she's not too eager to do it it is the work of untouchables yeah particularly disgusting unclean work uh, but you had to have somebody do it uh, but it was a shame to do it. That is just the opposite of honor. Not very honorable. Like, what well, was prostitution considered to be immoral in the ancient world? Well, it doesn't seem to have been in uh, ancient Israel. But it was shameful. There's certain things. Just think of uh, Belle Watlin in Gone with the Wind this madam of a brothel uh, she's a very moral character she makes a huge uh, donation for the confederate wounded but the prim and proper uh, uh, hypocrites uh, in the church won't take the money it's tainted money uh, but Melly uh, will uh, take it uh, she doesn't care where it comes from and uh, she's glad it comes from a good hearted person um, but uh, so what's the deal why can't uh, Belle show her face in public because she's dishonorable not immoral dishonorable morality and honor are two very different things and uh, you might call the dishonorable in contempt uh, but um, they might be good anyway and their function might be necessary and that of the untouchables was. Now, I know you're thinking Elliot Ness. We've got the place surrounded. Come on out. No. Uh, not that kind of untouchables. The ones where you would become uh, unclean ritually by touching them. Like lepers and Ben-Hur and so on. Uh, in uh, Leviticus, you can't touch somebody with an open sore lest you incur uncleanness. But on the other hand, a lot of Bible readers forget this. You're not told not to do it. Right? There are a lot of inevitable things you've got to do. Like that childbirth, for Pete's sake. Uh, nothing immoral about it, but technically because of the emission of blood, etc., it renders you ritually unclean. You're not supposed to avoid it necessarily. It's just that there's certain things to do to ritually cleanse yourself again. Well... These guys were so done, I'm talking about that uh, you damn well better just head in the other direction. You don't want this level of uh, uncleanness to attach to you. So, uh, Dravidians were at least shoveled down uh, to this, uh, to the Shudra level. And again, you couldn't get out of this. An interesting 
analogous development occurred in the Aryan mythology because they took their gods to be the high gods and the surviving gods of the, the Dravidians in large measure, generally speaking, to be lower entities, not devils. That's going to happen with the Zoroastrians. They're going to reverse the roles. But uh, rather what they called um, Asuras, lords, they are like the titans of Greek mythology. They're a big pain in the neck, but they are a kind of, and they're enemies of our gods, but in a sense they are kind of a rival, ousted dynasty of gods in their own right. And uh, occasionally they'd make a big deal out of this, not too often on Star Trek, uh, where they have the same thing. Uh, I love Star Trek for its its uh, broad uh, capacity of illustrating these things. They they had uh, various untouchable groups, various groups which uh, could do this and that. Uh, sometimes, like on the Next Generation episode, they had uh, groups differentiated uh, sexually, uh, and, and the unisex groups were. Uh, that was the norm, but if you were one of these deviants that was either uh, heterosexual or homo... Uh, hom well, no, I guess... Uh, well, either one, I suppose. If you recognize gender at all, you were pretty much one of the untouchables. And uh, um, you can think of other uh, examples of this, too. You, you're on the outs if you're... Uh, <laughs> or... Uh, <laughs> Seinfeld, which is all about, I mean, Star Trek goes into the shade next to Seinfeld in terms of constant uh, anthropological illustrations. The whole thing is like a comedy of manners and amoral, right? The, uh, there's never any morality in the thing. you lucky if you find, if you can tell what direction to go in and morally. But it's all about manners. And uh, uh, there's one where uh, George Costanza is uh, dating this woman who comes from a wealthy uh, background, and he's not unable to fake it pretty well, uh, but uh, he just can't really avoid completely this, the, the letting the real uh, George uh, come out, and so he's at a fancy dinner they're having, and he's washing his hands and he uh, kitchen sink and he notices in the uh, garbage can not touching any other garbage directly still in its uh, its little paper sleeve with only a bite taken out of it an intact chocolate eclair and he's still kind of hungry which both ways picks the thing up out of the garbage and starts eating it, at which precise moment, this girlfriend's mother comes in and looks at him with, with an expression of complete disgust and horror. Uh, and he's trying to explain it uh, later uh, on a phone call to his girlfriend. And, uh, and, and But Jerry will have none of it. He says, you cross the line between man and Bum. Yeah, right. What he did wasn't necessarily unhealthy. Sure wasn't immoral. But it was unclean to the point of excluding him from this social company. And Jerry thought rightly so. Well, that's kind of what you're, you're dealing with here. These inherited uh, prerogatives uh, and, and uh, inherited... Uh, what's the word? Uh, demerits and so on. So, um, you got the caste system partly as a result of an attempt to keep the races separate. And to some degree, I suppose that happened, but anyone that knows anything about India today knows that there are hundreds of ethnicities and languages in uh, India. And uh, for a long time, there have been some people predicting that India will unravel just as the Soviet Union did based on the same thing, an ethnic diversity that they could not clamp together for long. Eventually, the strain was too great. For years, people like uh, Andrea Maurick in a prophetic 
book called Will the Soviet Union Survive Until 1985? And then the publishers made him change it to 84 to uh, recall George Orwell. Well, he said it would not survive because the various republics had cultures very different from the Russian central culture and just would not stick with them. And bingo, uh, he was darn right. This was... Um, I think around 1970 that he wrote it and it wasn't quite 20 years before the jig was up and uh, Andrea Malrick uh, had figured it right wasn't exactly a predictive prophet but he was kind of like the guy in uh, he was like Harry Selden in uh, the Foundation series by Isaac Asimov he just had enough of a feel for what was going on and some think that India will divide up too so she wouldn't be surprised. Uh, what about the religion that went along with this, that was uh, part and parcel of this? Uh, well, I've already mentioned that there were different various gods and the different rival clans made sacrifices to them and that uh, the way they uh, did these sacrifices was all set down in scripture. Indeed, there were the three Vedas, I suppose you could say books of vision or books of wisdom. It's the same word uh, in Indo-European that uh, implies knowledge or sight. That was just seen with the mind. Veda comes from the same term, guess what, as video or vision uh, or wisdom. Uh, and uh, these Vedas, V-E-D-A-S, uh, elaborate them in a moment, they appear to have been written down between 1500 and 900 B.C. or B.C.E. Now, they're clearly traditional lore. That is, they must have been getting repeated for hundreds of years before this. So how old are all these chants to the gods? We don't know. Very difficult to say. But even their written stuff it goes this far back. Uh, and each written book is a compilation of various uh, traditional chants. The first and most famous of these is the Rig Veda, often spelled as two words in English, R-I-G and then V-E-D-A, but more directly reflecting these underlying Sanskrit, sometimes one just reads all in one word, Rig Veda, R-G-V-E-D-A. I prefer the two words just because it's a little easier for me to uh, say. This is just like the book of Psalms. Now, their copies aren't because the canonical ones are laden with all manner of commentary and such that obscure the outline of the original, but uh, Western translations are published in such a way as to isolate the original hymnic, uh, well, the original hymns, and um, there are various editions, and I want to read to you uh, out of one of them in a moment. And, uh, let's see, this has 1,028 hymns in it. By contrast, the biblical book of Psalms, which is, as I say, the same sort of thing, has 150 psalms. Now, have you ever gotten through the whole book of Psalms? Well, I love being the Sunday school mom here and saying, well, if you haven't, you should have. I mean, any ostensible Bible fan certainly should, should be conversing with the Psalms. But you had a bit of a taller order if you want to become familiar with the Rig Veda with, let me say it again, a thousand twenty-eight hymns, some of which are very short, but many of which are exceedingly long. Same sort of variety you have in the Quran. Uh, may I suggest a little devotional exercise for you? And this is whether you're a devotional type person or not. Even if you're not, you want to know what you're talking about, right? I mean, boy, do I hate people pontificating about, oh, well, the scripture says, and they've never even read the thing. And they might have read some of their own, but uh, they uh, 
you know, where do they get off telling you what the other guy's scripture says when they haven't even read it? I knew this uh, shout fanatical Bible preacher from uh, some independent Baptist church years ago, Brother Bill Dougherty. I mean, he, he would stake me like a vampire if he had the chance and even knew who I was. Uh, but I, I uh, had a certain sense of admiration for the guy. I mean, now in my book, he's a kook. You know, you witness to hundreds of people a year, which, you know, by definition, you're a fanatic if you're doing that. Uh, and he was a fanatic, but let it be said, he had a good sense of humor, too. And he was like Billy Sunday, muscular Christianity. He was like a Marine drill sergeant. And we had him at the uh, uh, religious retreat for the Baptist church I went to many years ago in high school. And one night he said, How many of you believe the whole Bible? Cover to cover. Well, you know, all the hands went up. And then he says, How many of you have read the Bible cover to cover? <laughs> well, almost nobody's hands went up. And he said, You dumbheads! How can you believe the thing when you haven't even read it? <laughs> Good question, Brother Bill. Uh, of course, you know the answer. You know, whatever it says, I'll believe. Uh, which way did he go, George? Which way did he go? Yeah, you know, just, uh, you know, I'm a robot. I'll just take the programming. Uh, well, yeah, I don't want to hear anybody say, well, the Hindus say this uh, without actually having read the stuff, right? So, why don't you uh, take uh, three Vedic hymns a day and read them and familiarize yourself with it? Uh, I did that once, and boy, it was fun. In fact, that wasn't enough for me. I decided to read a surah of the Quran and a psalm as well every day. And uh, it really, you know, increases your knowledge fast. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the Vedic hymns are much like the psalms. They uh, praise the various gods. And uh, this is really valuable for us trying to reconstruct what the religion was like because they... They are there buttering up the gods, hoping that they will do miracles for them and give them victories, just as they did for the ancestors. And so, what can you expect? Great tales of the victories wrought in the past by these deities. Oh, uh, Lord Indra, who, who uh, whelmed the dragon Vritra and brought life back to the world, who was given power by imbibing the ecstatic cup of Soma, etc., etc. Well, you have loads of these things, and they tell you quite a bit about the different deities to which they're addressed. By far, most of them are to the warrior King Indra, who was like Thor and Zeus and Jehovah. We'll get to him in a moment. The, the thunderer, the warrior. The uh, next biggest group are uh, addressed to Agni, the priest of the gods. But uh, very many gods have a lot of uh, hymns addressed to them, and they tell us both about the ritual and about the myths of the gods. So very handy stuff for a religious historian. And it ain't bad as religious poetry, too. I'm going to read you one of my favorites in a little bit. The uh, next, uh, number two of the three Vedas was the Sama Veda, S-A-M-A, -A, Sama Veda. This was like a like the Book of Common Prayer or a priestly breviary or missal or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it was a service book. So it had an awful lot of the text of the hymns from the Rig Veda, but it had various liturgical rubrics and prayers and stuff like that for every appointed occasion. So kind of like Bible and prayer book. The third one was the Yajur Veda, uh, which in my sources was traditionally called, was spelled a J A. I'm sorry, Y A J U R. But sometimes one reads it without the Y. Ajur Veda. This contains various, uh, I think, secondarily medical. Uh, information, a dietary information, which is where they get the Ayurvedic medicine they talk about these days. 
but the main point of it is it's like the book of Leviticus in the Bible it is a bunch of sacrificial formulae and directions you got to perform the sacrifices just right remember what happened to Nadab and Abihu though they had been privileged to see the God of Israel in person uh, somewhere along the line these guys screwed up the incense recipe and offered strange fire before Yahweh and naturally he killed them for it uh, well those are cautionary tales hey these are the protocols of the very gods of heaven. You better make sure you get it right, mortal. Uh, and so you got all the precise formulas. Now, why would they become precise? Just to impress the rubes? It, it could be. But I think there's another obvious answer. Remember, these rituals were supposed to bring results, answered prayers from the gods. Now, if you didn't get what you wanted, uh, there's always a couple of good explanations. Uh, you've done something you've forgotten that displeased them and negated uh, this uh, sacrifice you offered, or somebody else offered a better one and overruled you. I mean, like you got uh, two churches across the county line from each other. One of them prays for sunshine for a picnic, and the other's praying for rain for the farmer's crops. Uh, you know, one's not going to get answered. Uh, how do you decide which one? Well, who knows? But uh, uh, but it's always possible if you didn't get what you thought you should have gotten, you may figure, you know, I wonder if we made a misstep or a miscalculation somewhere. Is it possible we didn't say the thing right or say the right thing? Uh, back to the drawing board. Uh, I imagine, or think of uh, in the gospel, the gospel of Mark, where uh, Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration with a few of the disciples to find the rest of them engaged in a shouting match with an unsatisfied customer. Things don't change much, and Jesus said, "Wait a minute, what's going on here?" And this guy says, "Hey, I brought my demoniac son to your uh, high and mighty apostles here, figuring they could cure him, but they haven't." And uh, then a crowd is building, and Jesus says, okay, well, let's deal with this fast. And he cast the demon out of the kid, and afterward the disciples are saying, why weren't we able to cast the demon out? And he says, well, this kind comes out only with prayer. And, uh, of course, Jesus wasn't shown praying. Uh, and uh, then in some manuscripts it says, and fasting. You see what's happened there? Uh, Jesus just cast the demon out because he was Jesus. Uh, but uh, that's the original point of that story. Oh, look what Jesus can do. Even his own disciples are stumped, but he does it with no problem. Well, after a while, you know, that's good for evangelism. People need to be convinced Jesus is Superman, and that uh, shows that he is. But uh, you're a Christian. You take that for granted, though parable is reapplied as it becomes an example for Christian exorcists to use, how to do it. And it doesn't work. So they go back to the drawing board. Well, maybe uh, some demons require a long season of prayer first before you're ready to go do it. I don't know why that would be, since uh, supposedly the power is in the name you invoke, um, not in your own personal holiness, but nonetheless, they figured, well, maybe, maybe that's what it takes. A lot of prayer. Eh, but you know what happened. Sometimes, at least, even that didn't work. The demon was still ridiculing you and making fun of your flood pants and stuff. Uh, and so, uh, well, maybe fasting would help. Uh, who knows what else got added to the list. Well, in, in the same measure, I'm suggesting these long, uh, ever more detailed rituals grew. Uh, so people were trying to eliminate variables and stipulate everything so they could be sure it wouldn't work. I was just watching a Twilight Zone episode last night where this guy's making a deal with the devil. and uh, Or another one, the same night. Uh, this guy's making a list of wishes for a genie. And you know what happens in these stories, right? They always backfire. Well, in both cases, the, the person bargaining with the supernatural is trying to stipulate the wishes exactly so that it doesn't backfire, and they can never foresee everything, and so it always does. Oh, I should have thought of so-and-so. Oh, I should have remembered so-and-so. And I always get screwed. Uh, well, 
then again, that's what I'm saying. Like they came up with longer and longer lists of stipulations and conditions, hoping to eliminate any variable that the genie or the devil uh, could uh, seize on, loophole to uh, screw them. Same thing here. We don't want to leave anything to chance, and so the uh, various uh, rituals grow longer and longer. Well, those were the three Vedas originally, but nowadays they speak of a fourth Veda and the four Vedas. The fourth is the people's scripture, the Atharva Veda, A-T-H-A-R-V-A. This is a compendium of people's religion, stuff that... Now, the other ones... Right. Obviously, from what I've said, they're technical handbooks for the priests. You wouldn't have your own copy of any of this stuff. Uh, but uh, you might not even have a copy of the Atharva Veda either. Uh, but the thing is, that was compiled from charms and prayers and so on that you would have learned through oral tradition. So this was the people's religion as opposed to the priestly religion. But eventually, you know, you can't beat them, join them. You add it to the canon. Uh, to that way, uh, the common people will not, right, you really wouldn't want to do this, they will not start thinking that the rituals are unimportant because i got my own access to the gods. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, you can do that stuff, that's fine. But for the big ticket items, you still want to come to us. Now I'm going to wait on reading any of the Rig Veda until uh, uh, I want to... Uh, use some of those as illustrations for the high gods. But I want to read you a few snippets from the from my well thumbed copy of the Atharva Veda. Oh, this is just great fun. Uh, suppose you got a nagging cough and I guess I hadn't invented cough medicine yet. Uh, well you want to get rid of a cough, so here's what you do. The charm against cough. As the soul with the soul's desires swiftly to a distance flies, thus do thou, O cough, fly forth along the soul's course of flight. As a well-sharpened arrow swiftly to a distance flies, thus do thou, O cough, fly forth along the expanse of the earth. As the rays of the sun swiftly to a distance fly, thus do thou, O cough, fly forth along the flood of the sea. Well, that's pretty good. I, mean, I suppose it doesn't work. Well, maybe it coughed while doing it. I don't know. Uh, I will discreetly not read the text of a couple of these, like the charm against excessive discharges from the body. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's leave that one, I guess. Uh, um, uh, but uh, what have we with... Uh, oh, Mm, well, there's several of these kind of things. Here's one charm against constipation and the uh, uh, <laughs> and the retention of urine. Why not? Uh, we know the father of the arrow, Parjanya of hundredfold power. With this charm may I render comfortable thy body, make thy outpouring upon the earth. Out of thee may it come with the sound bow. We know the father of the arrow, Mitra, etc., etc. And then they repeat the names of Varuna, Khandra, Surya, and so on. So you invoke these various deities. That which has accumulated in thy entrails, in thy canals, in thy bladder, thus let thy urine be released out completely with a sound bow. I guess that's Sanskrit for plop or something. I split open thy penis like the dike of a lake. Thus let thy urine be released out completely with a sound bow. Relaxes the opening of thy bladder like the ocean, the reservoir of water. Thus let thy urine be released out completely with a sound bow, etc. You get the idea. Um, how about the, uh, well, the charm against dropsy and so on and so on. I uh, think this is a goodie. 
uh, how about uh, you're afraid somebody is um, putting magic spells on you well you might say this the spell which they have put out for thee into an unburned vessel, that which they have put into mixed grain, that which they have put into raw meat, that do I hurl back again. The spell which they have put for thee into a cock, or that they have put into a goat, into a crested animal, that which they have put into a sheep, that do I hurl back again. The spell which they have put for thee into solipeds, into animals with teeth on both sides, that which they have put into an ass, that do I hurl back again. The magic which they have put for thee into movable property and, or into personal possession, the spell which they have put into the field, that do I hurl back again. The spell which evil scheming persons have put for thee into the uh, Garhapatya fire or into the house fire that which they have put into the house that do I hurl back again the, the spell which they have put for thee into the assembly hall that which they have put into the gaming place that which they have put into the dice that do I hurl back again and there's more about uh, that kind of thing there are in, imprecations against demons um, how about uh Ooh, uh, romance. Um, just saw Twilight Zone last night on the July 4th marathon. This guy is desperately in love with this woman. They won't give him the time of day. And, of course, he goes and buys love potion number nine. Well, here's what he'd have done in ancient India. Charm to arouse the passionate... Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, this is a woman for a man, yeah. Uh, charm to arouse the passionate love of a man. From thy head unto thy feet do I implant love's longing into thee. Ye gods, send forth the yearning love. May yonder man burn after me. Think of this plan, Anumati. Fit together, Akuti. Ye gods, send forth the yearning love. May yonder man burn after me. If thou dost run three leagues away, or even five leagues, the distance coursed by a horseman, from there thou shalt again return. Shalt be the father of our sons. And there's more of the same. Ooh, you might uh, want to... Use this one before you go into battle. Charm, battle charm against arrow wounds. The piercing arrow shall not hit us, nor shall the striking arrows hit us. Far away from us, O Indra, to either side, cause the arrow shower to fall. Uh, by the way, let me elucidate a point in uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. You remember where uh, he's hanging on to the last rope of that drawbridge and he's holding the Shivalinga stones uh, and uh, suddenly a hail of arrows is unleashed by the crack marksman of a thuggy sect and not a one of them hits Indiana Jones. When I first saw that, in my unenlightened state, I thought, boy, that is just too much to ask of the viewer. But then I realized, you fool, Shiva's protecting him. This is exactly what happened. To either side of us, the arrows shall fall those that have been shot and shall be shot. Ye divine and ye human arrows, pierce ye mine enemies. Be he our own, or be he strange, the kinsman of a foreigner, who bear enmity toward us, those enemies of mine, Rudra, shall pierce with a shower of arrows. Him that rivals us, or does not rival us, him that curses us with hate, may all the gods injure. My charm protects me from within. That's pretty darn good. Uh, does that remind you of anything in the Bible? Well, it should, hallelujah, uh, because uh, we have a similar guarantee uh, in the Psalms. The king uh, sings or chants this one. He who dwells in the shelter of Elyon, so, I say this is 91, who abides in the shadow of Shaddai, will say to Yahweh, my refuge and my fortress, 
uh, Eloi, in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made Yahweh your refuge and Elyon your habitation, no evil shall befall you. No scourge come near your tent, for he will give his angels charge of you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. Same sort of thing. Because the sacred kings in both cases need battle protection. Um, we have our Oh boy, there are all kinds of goodies here. I just don't have time to read, but I believe I will uh, take a crack at this one. How about a prayer for success in gambling. Saw another Twilight Zone last night where a guy goes to Las Vegas and he's winning everything because his buddy, played by uh, Buddy Epson, it has psychokinetic powers. <laughs> well, he wouldn't have needed this, but maybe that was his version. The successful, victorious, skillfully gaming Apsara, that Apsara who makes the winnings in the game of dice do I call hither the skillfully gaming Apsara who sweeps and heaps up the stakes that Apsara who takes the winnings in the game of dice do I call hither may she who dances about with the dice when she takes the stakes from the game of dice when she desires to win for us may she obtain the advantage by her magic may she come to us full of abundance uh, let them not win this wealth of ours. The Apsaras who rejoice in dice, who carry grief and wrath to the losers, that joyful and exulting Apsara do I call hither. I suppose you lost a couple of calves that have strayed into the distance, like when Saul loses his father's donkeys. Well, there's one to pray for that. Uh, and uh, there's one for almost every occasion. And suppose uh, you've got nightmares you can't get rid of. How about this? Thou who art neither alive nor dead, the immortal child of the gods art thou, O sleep. Varunani is thy mother, Yama, death, thy father, Araru is thy name. We know, O sleep, thy birth. Thou art the son of the divine women folk, the instrument of Yama. Thou art the ender, thou art death. Thus do we know thee, O sleep. Do thou, O sleep, protect us from evil dreams. As one pays off a sixteenth, an eighth, or an entire debt, Thus do we transfer every evil dream upon our enemy. <laughs> Isn't that special? Yeah, well, um, I certainly think it is. Uh, so, the uh, the people's scripture gets uh, added on to the canon. And why not, one may ask. All right. Uh, what else? What was the uh, priestly religion like? I mean, what did they do? Well, I've said it already. Basically, sacrifice. What did they sacrifice? Well, um, there had been instances of human sacrifice. There are remains in an ancient altar of the god Narayana, later conflated with Vishnu, that indicate that he had once received such tasty goodies. Uh, but uh, on the whole, uh, it's various animals, um, cows and the like, but horses were big. 
Uh, this is, uh, to you know, a lot of Western people, that is almost as bad as human sacrifice. But there were all these guys were horsemen. They had plenty of them, and they were the big ticket item. And um, but then there were, you know, you can just sacrifice all manner of goodies. I mean, if you like, the chances are the, the gods did. And uh, what they would do is to invoke. Agni, A-G-N-I, the heavenly priest of the gods, and they would create an altar right on the ground rather than a stone altar. They would mow the uh, the area and take the, the clippings and uh, make a, a border with them around the central area. And that's where the sacrifice would be offered. Uh, that's where the fire would be lit. And uh, as they lit it, they would be singing an invocation to Agni, whose name is obviously the same as the word ignite from our Indo-European linguistic heritage. They would ignite the fire, calling upon Agni. Couldn't have a sacrifice without the fire. And if you personified that ritual, you couldn't have a sacrifice without the attendance thereupon of the god Agni, the heavenly high priest. But you would often also invoke the god Soma, who was a god of the moon and of the sea and of the mushrooms. Uh, these associations do fit together, partly because of the reflection of the uh, moon in the sea and the uh, similarity between the lunar surface and the cap of a mushroom and so on. And uh, the reason this was important was a sacrifice was a visionary experience on the part of the priests. They didn't just assume or hope or believe the gods were there receiving the sacrifice. They knew darn well they were there because they could see them. Uh, they would uh, gather the sacred mushroom, which appears to be uh, Amanita muscaria, that, um, Wasson wrote about uh, Soma and Ch oh, was it mush sacred mushroom of in immortality, and John Allegro wrote it uh, wrote a book about it, uh, the sacred mushroom and the cross, where he thought Christianity uh, had originated as a, a group like this, and. Um, uh, if, if as a Christ myth theorist, if you happen to be one, you ever want people not to think you're an extremist, you can always point to John Allegro, right? He's always even further to the left than you are. Anyway, um, the, the priests would gather this, this sacred mushroom, and like a pharmacist, he would uh, beat it uh, in a mortar and pestle uh, until the, the juice came out and would be mixed with milk or whatever. And they would drink it and have visions of the gods, visionary journeys into the world of the gods. Uh, in the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, Martin Luther used to make great fun of the fact that they wouldn't, the priests would take the sacraments and not allow the laity to do so. And he said, you know, where do you get off doing that? Everybody should take the sacraments. Well, did people in uh, the Vedic religion? Well, yeah, they did, but they had to cut the stuff. The potency was so great that uh, all the worshippers were offered was the urine of the priests who had drunk it straight, because that way it would uh, not be too much and overpower the, the folks in the pews. And I would like to... Uh, if I can find the thing, uh, read you my uh, favorite Soma hymn. I really love this one. I think it's I'm reading from the translation of uh, Wendy Doniger O'Flaherty. And uh, this is from the Penguin, a partial translation. And this is just a selection of the. the um, of the vast ocean of the Rig Veda. Okay, I think I have it here. You think you have something marked, and then you probably used the thing for something else and lost your page. Yeah. So the Brahmin priest would invoke 
Indra to drink the Soma along with him, Indra being a great imbiber of Soma to give him the power to defeat his enemies. And uh, one of the enemies was Vritra the dragon, so that's mentioned here. Let Indra, the killer of Vritra, drink Soma in Saryanavat, gathering his strength within himself to do a great heroic deed. O oh, drop of Soma, flow for Indra. Purify yourself, generous Soma, from Arjika, master of the quarters of the sky, pressed with sacred words, with truth and faith and ardor. O oh, drop of Soma, flow for Indra. The daughter of the sun has brought the buffalo raised by Pardanya. The divine youths have received him and placed the juice in Soma. O oh, drop of Soma, flow for Indra. You speak of the sacred as your brightness is sacred. You speak of the truth as your deeds are true. You speak of faith, King Soma, as you are carefully prepared by the sacrificial priest. O oh, drop of Soma, flow for Indra. The floods of the High One, the truly awesome One, flow together. The juices of him so full of juice mingle together as you, the tawny one, purify yourself with prayer. O drop of Soma, flow for Indra. For the high priest speaks rhythmic words, O purifier, holding the pressing stone, feeling that he has become great with the Soma, giving birth to joy through the Soma, O oh, drop of Soma, flow for Indra. Where the indistinguishable light shines, the world where the sun was placed, in that immortal, unfading world, O oh, purifier, place me. O oh, drop of Soma, flow for Indra. Where Vivasvan's son is king, where heaven is enclosed, where those young waters are, there make me immortal. O oh, drop of Soma, flow for Indra. Where they move as they will in the triple dome in the third heaven of heaven, where the worlds are made of light, there make me immortal. O oh, drop of Soma, flow for Indra. Where there are desires and longings that the sun seeneth, where the dead are fed and satisfied, there make me immortal, O drop of Soma, flow for Indra. Where there are joys and pleasures, gladness and delight, where the desires of Soma are fulfilled, there make me immortal. O oh, drop of Soma, flow for Indra. I don't know about you, but in my opinion, that ain't bad. Uh, well, is it... Uh, and, and by the way, uh, I, well, uh, Soma is, is a god with, with many uh, hymns addressed to him, exceeded in number only by those addressed to Indra and Agni, uh, let me just uh, say something quickly about this. Uh, as I say, it, it, they, they realized that the um, rituals, in a sense, were more powerful than the gods since they imparted the power to the gods. Now, how'd they do that? Well, they didn't believe that the mere physical food and other substances offered to the gods could feed them and empower them. They believed that... that um, well, otherwise, why couldn't anybody just set the stuff on fire? Well, it, it, rather, the ritual unlocked a secret, or as they call it, occult, meaning just hidden, force that fed the gods. This was what made the world go round, and they called it Brahman. Now, this gets confusing because it's the same darn words, um, maybe a vowel point two difference here and there between the Brahmin priests, the creator god Brahma, the absolute philosophical uh, entity Brahman, the power of the sacrifice, also called Brahman. It's all even closer in Sanskrit, uh, but Western scholars differentiate them slightly, just like 
keep everything differentiated. But Brahman, also called Brihaspati, uh, was the secret power in the sacrifice that nourished and even ultimately controlled the gods. Hence, again, you see the power of the priests. It's interesting, even if one looks at it etymologically, to see how the gods are a function of worship. That worship is really prior to the gods. And you can tell that because, especially in the cases of Agni and Soma, it's clear you have an aspect of the ritual personified and then deified. What is Agni? The sacrificial fire. Uh, it's a thing, but it's made, but an aspect of the religious ritual, of the sacred, becomes a sacred entity, a sacred person with his own myths. Uh, what was Soma? It was the sacramental hallucinogenic mushroom. Uh, how does it become a god? Well, it's so important. You put a halo on it. You make it into a god. You can find the same thing as Gilbert Murray points out in the Five Stages of Greek Religion, uh, where he says that uh, there are, there are strange-sounding divine names among archaic Greek pantheons that are obviously simply personifications of parts of the ritual. Now, this is very interesting to me, especially since our word in English, God, which does not go back to any of these Sanskrit words. Uh, well, let me just tell you, let me just draw a distinction here. Uh, the, uh, the word uh, theos in Greek, like in the New Testament when they talk about God, that is simply a dialectical variant of Zeus uh, and uh, Theos Zeus is pronounced differently in different areas so it simply means what? actually not God but uh, the bright sky just as Dius Pitar father Dius, father Zeus father Theos is the, the, the sky father and uh, so this becomes Deus in Latin as well so you're talking about the brightness of the sky with a thunder god Zeus, Jupiter etc but that is not the kind of association you have uh, with um, uh, with, the, uh, with uh, the English word god now there's a common misconception floating around that God is just good with one less O and that devil is just evil with an extra D. Yeah, that's not true. Devil comes from Diabolos, the caster of aspersions, the, the slinger of mud, the accuser of our brethren. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with evil. Uh, but to our point here, neither does God have aught to do with good God, uh, good comes from an old English word meaning fitting appropriate right for the occasion whereas God comes from a Germanic word uh, Gott uh, which means the invoked the one invoked now that's interesting it certainly implies there is a being whose presence you are summoning. And yet, look at the emphasis on the role of the ritual. What is it that, that is the center? It is that invoked. It is that which, like Agni and Soma, plays a certain role in the liturgy. Uh, to me, that is very intriguing theologically. It implies like Don Cupid and his non-realist theology that religion and well that God is a function of worship it is not some prior object that calls it forth God exists to all intents and purposes in worship as in Psalm 22 God inhabits the praise of his people fascinating uh, well who knows uh, uh, something to think about though and uh, what we will do 
uh, next time is to uh, look.